Welcome back to The Conservative. Hi there, I'm Mike Lannan. I'm your uh, host for today. And um, we are going to have a very quick half hour. We've got a lot of things that we could discuss. I'm not quite sure where we'll begin, but uh, as I sit here today, we've just uh, announced to the nation who the uh, running mate for Joe Biden will be. Very interesting election that we've got coming up here now. We've got the uh, Republican side of less her government and the democratic side of wanting a large government and I'll spend quite a bit of time uh, trying to uh, talk to you very rapidly or talk with you very rapidly about the government of um, the Democrats so let's get right to it and talk about very quickly uh, the in the basement candidate Joe Biden who uh, hasn't been really out of his basement more than two or three times since uh, he uh, became the presumptive nominee for the Democratic Party. Now, as this is the end of the uh, second day that uh, he has announced Kamala uh, Harris as his running mate, uh, by the time you get this show done in two weeks' time, they will have had their convention and we will have probably seen that Joe Biden give at least a teleprompter speech if he can remember to do it. No, that's going to be a concern because uh, if anybody is now beginning to watch Joe, uh, who has been a politician for over 50 years, uh, he is declining in uh, mental acuity. I'm sorry to have to say that, but you watch and it's very evident that uh, there's a decline going on there. Now, uh, what's interesting is that if he should become president of the United States, he will be going into office at the age that Ronald Reagan, who was one of our oldest presidents, was leaving office. So that would put uh, Joe Biden at approximately 78 uh, years of age, maybe 79. That's a very uh, old person if you're not functioning both intellectually, uh, um, physically and uh, spiritually. And you know I've talked about that equilateral triangle with you many times. And so if you don't have those three things going on equally, then you have some serious problems at any age. But as you're growing older, it becomes more evident. Joe walks with a particularly slow uh, limping gait from what I can observe. He's having a lot of trouble putting together uh, sentences in a uh, cohesive uh, uh, manner, <coughs> even when he has um, a teleprompter. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that is all about, but um, from a spiritual side, he's a Roman Catholic, and they have gone after him all over the nation in the conservative Roman Catholic Church, which would be the Roman Catholic Church, the one that adheres to... Uh, Catholic principles, uh, they've even denied him uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion in certain parishes throughout this nation. <coughs> so why would that be true? Well, it's true because in Roman Catholicism, you cannot uh, be a strong proponent of abortion and be a Roman Catholic. There's no way that those two are compatible, including, quite frankly, you can't be an LBGTQ uh, proponent. You can't, you can't, you can't uh, say that the biblical record and the Catholic record allows for that uh, activity to occur. So those become huge problems for Joe Biden. And then he selects a uh, candidate uh, and he does it politically to check off boxes as far as I'm concerned. He, he checks off for a woman. He checks off for a uh, minority woman, um, uh, a black woman. Uh, I'm not quite sure that she's uh, totally a black woman. She's probably more like uh, President Obama was, which is a mixed race, which to me makes no difference at all. Uh, you have to go with what Martin Luther King said, and that is you judge people by their heart. And in my mind, uh, the way my mommy and daddy taught me um, is that you look at people and realize that there are only two possible uh, races of humans. Uh, 
And those races are decent humans and indecent humans. So it doesn't matter what your color is. What matters whether or not you fall into the, one of those two categories. You're either a decent human being or you're an indecent human being. Other than that, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter to me. So uh, uh, a lot of this uh, uh, race uh, problem in the America is because people don't see it that way or they're indecent human beings. And I'm watching carefully the minority police forces, and I mean the minority police forces, uh, the, the police officers who uh, go out and do something that's not right. They do something that's indecent. Now, that's being said on the right-hand side of things. You've got to also realize is that some of these people that are being arrested are indeed resisting arrest. They're giving that officer a terrible hard time. And humans are humans. Uh, and I've said this before, if you want to cause a real problem with a human being, uh, swear at him, uh, call him a bad name, uh, use the F word. I mean, you, you, as you sit here and you listen to this show, you, you can think yourself, what are the things that uh, people could say to you that would uh, stand the hairs on the back of your neck and make you so angry that you might um, lose it? You might do something that you would not normally do. So we have... Uh, the psychological principles of fight, uh, flight, or freeze. So those three appropriate F words, um, you either fight, you have flight, or you freeze. Well, <coughs> when you're in a situation, and it's not, uh, this cough is not because of COVID, it's because I'm talking and I've got these hot lights on me, which causes uh, the dry throat. But when you have fight, fear, or uh, freeze as the three possible uh, reactions to a situation and you're uh, being threatened or you're in a policeman uh, uh, against the, a person that you're trying to arrest for whatever reason and there's a uh, fight coming from them. And that can be a verbal fight that it causes your uh, hair to stand on the back of your neck and to fear uh, for your own life, you're not going to flee as a police officer. They are trained to flee into harm's way. Um, they're not trained to flee away from it. And I would suspect that most officers don't freeze. So therefore, there's only one thing left out of those three Fs, and that would be to fight. And so uh, I can see where a police officer can get really stressed and cause uh, the person that's in front of him who's not cooperating some serious hurt. And uh, is it right? Probably not. But is it right that we now uh, decide that we're going to defund the police? Well, I find it very interesting. And there's been cases in the country where these folks that have been yelling and screaming about defunding the police have in the last two to three months needed the police and who do you think they call? They call the police. Who are you going to call when you are in need of someone to protect you? Uh, you have uh, very few categories from which to uh, select essential workers. One of them is for protection from crime and that would be the police department. And so who are you going to call? So let's defund them. Now who are you going to call? Do you call the selectmen? They're not trained to do that. Do you call a doctor? They're not trained to do that. Do you call, as most people are suggesting, a social worker? Well, I just can't imagine a social worker going to a domestic dispute and somehow saying, oh, come on now, let's everybody, let's calm down. When a police officer goes to a domestic dispute, they know that their lives are usually put right on the line. That's the number one way that a police officer in America gets killed is in a domestic dispute response. So they're being called to go and somebody goes crazy at that domestic dispute, normally a man, and the police officer gets shot and or gets knifed. Uh, so th that becomes a problem. So when we get back to the vice president selection by Joe Biden, she believes in the uh, removal of the police force. She has stated publicly that she believes that the police should be defunded and that the police 
power should be changed significantly. Now, this is a lady that comes out of the law enforcement ranks. She was allegedly a prosecutor for uh, California as the attorney general, and prior to that, a prosecutor for one of the cities there. And from what I understand, without looking into the tons of the research, she wasn't very good at either job. So um, my uh, cursory uh, review of her was that uh, she put a lot of people away that were using marijuana but did absolutely nothing for the pedophilia cases that were uh, being charged at that time against the Roman Catholic Church. She put those under the rug. So, I mean, somebody's going to have to take, and re take a real good look at her record and what she's uh, willing to do. Well, from my position, this is a lady that has stated that a woman has the right to decide all the way up until the time of the birth of the child, not the time of, the child is now born, the woman can decide if that baby is viable or if she wants that baby. So therefore, after the baby is born, is breathing, she has still the right, as the governor in Virginia uh, voted and legislated for, the right to kill that baby. So um, those are the things, uh, I've just named two problems here with this particular candidate. And this candidate has to be ready to go if, if Biden-Harris should become the next president, vice president of this country. That candidate named Harris has to be ready to step in to the uh, position of president immediately. And I found it very interesting that within two days of her being nominated as the running mate for Joe Biden, that CNN already had a uh, talk show presentation about how Biden would step aside. I don't know how that happens unless you use the 25th Amendment. He becomes dysfunctional for uh, mental problems or physical problems. He becomes dysfunctional and they have to use the 25th Amendment to remove him from office unless there's a plot out there that he will just step down the minute he becomes president, she becomes president of the United States, uh, boy, we had better really do some thinking about whether or not we want that to happen. Because if you recall, during the primary, she um, uh, got off to a very fast start, but then uh, faltered miserably by the uh, mid-December and was out of the race with never even having one single vote cast for her. Uh, her fundraising dried up, her uh, ability to uh, uh, speak to the uh, electorate uh, in the states that she was trying to raise uh, <coughs> votes uh, failed. Now all of a sudden she becomes the nominee for the party and people think that somehow now she's a great campaigner. Well that's going to be remain to be seen because um, up until December, mid-December of 2019, she was not a good candidate and did not do a good job at convincing people that she was a viable, likable, electable candidate. And uh, she was one of the first to drop out. So the Dems have a huge problem with um, <clears throat> the two candidates. They've got a, a uh, gentleman that um, doesn't look like he's ready to step in and be president of the United States, and you've got a woman who is so far left of um, what the moderate position should be in this country. As I've said many times, this is basically a moderate uh, conservative nation still. Uh, we have not, as a nation, decided as a nation that we should become a socialistic slash communist uh, uh, nation. and. Um, this election is going to really decide just which direction we're going to head over the next, uh, and I'm going to say the next 20 years, because it's going to take some time to change it over, although from uh, 1910 to 1917 it didn't take very much time for the Communist Party to come to power uh, in the Soviet Union, and then we've seen the domino trickle-down effect over to uh, other communist nations. But in 1910, most people don't realize where the communist state actually started, and that was in Portugal, believe it or not. And in 1910, 
the communists took over. And from Lenin's perspective, it was supposed to have occurred worldwide, but it didn't get that kind of a foothold. It took time, and even to this day, taking time for people to experiment and find out that it doesn't work, and then to uh, suffer the consequences for trying to make it work. So how did that happen? Well, if you remember my last episode of The Conservative, I was talking about how important it is for uh, people to uh, riot in the streets, to take down um, the uh, spiritual well-being of the nation. You have to attack the churches. Lenin said that, Marx said that, uh, the opiate of the people had to be destroyed, and that was the churches. And so uh, that's under attack today, the freedom of religion. Uh, is, is a big, big issue right now. And if you watch the overreach of the government, we can protest in the streets, no masks, we can burn down uh, businesses, we can loot, we can destroy, and have no consequences to those folks. But if you read carefully uh, the government's overreach of saying to churches that they cannot have Sunday worship, or if they do have it, they have to be very restricted and they've actually arrested pastors for keeping their churches open. They've actually uh, caused <clears throat> street problems uh, for those who have been in the street praying for uh, peace in the nation. Uh, you can go to YouTube's network and see some of these cases. Certainly I've been there, I've watched some of the things that have happened and uh, Christianity, uh, <clears throat> the Muslim religion, uh, those um, two in this country are under pretty strong attack, and especially the Christian religion is really under attack because people know that we have to destroy the Judeo-Christian principles of what this nation was founded on in order to destroy the nation. So that's the first thing we have to do <clears throat> is destroy that with government overreach. The next thing we have to do is to change the uh, educational process of how we change uh, intellectually our youth and we've been done that now for about 50 years we've uh, started at the universities and we've got this uh, lack of ability to allow uh, the conservative viewpoint to hit the campuses thank the Lord for Donald Trump saying that further uh, allowances of the universities to not have a equal voice across the board both liberal and conservative voices to be allowed on the campuses to speak would it result in those universities losing any form of federal funds. Now, how he's going about doing that, I'm not sure. I didn't look into it further. Um, but I do know that he did make a executive order that demanded that there had to be equality across the board for public funds to be used by uh, colleges and universities. But that's not the, that's just the tip of the iceberg because you can go right down through the educational process and realize that even to this point in time right now, the overreach by government to see how the uh, uh, non-conservative approach to allowing children to go back into the classroom to, to uh, the kind of education that we're going to now uh, demand for the next six months or a year is as one of the doctors said yesterday, uh, going to destroy the economic uh, impact of children's earning power by 10 or more percent over their lifetime because we are not going to come back from a year of um, uh, losing out on education. Uh, education is, is very, very important and the younger you are, the more important it is because um, anybody that uh, listens to uh, brain research, neuroscience, will know that um, the plasticity of the brain is much more plastic, much more ability to learn the younger you are. So uh, uh, children learn to uh, walk and they learn to talk and they learn to do a lot of things in that first year and that second year and that third year. So that by the time they hit preschool and they hit kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, their minds are absorbing like sponges tons and tons of information. You don't have to listen to me about that. You can just look at your own grandchildren or your own children or children in your neighborhood and realize that they're smart little cookies and then we begin to uh, stifle and destroy that creativity uh, 
And so they don't become as smart as we think they are. And the best thing to do is to look before COVID even hit, that Wuhan virus even hit. We had children uh, who were testing in the national, worldwide, uh, international assessments. Uh, the United States was, uh, again, after another 10 years, dropping significantly into the lower and lower ranks of where other nations stood. Well, education is very, very important to maintaining a solid uh, United States. Without that education, we'll fall further and further behind and other countries will uh, eventually be able to eat our lunch. Now, up until 50 years ago, we were one of the most innovative countries in the world. Uh, we came out of World War II with the greatest nation, uh, the greatest um, generation, and we did come out of World War II and built uh, one of the strongest nations, well, I would say the strongest nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth. And uh, without that education, we are going to be in um, deep, deep weeds. So uh, the left, the socialist communist left, knows that we need to, one, destroy the Judeo-Christian values. That means destroy religion. The next thing they have to destroy is the uh, intellectual side of that triangle. <clears throat> and they're doing a very good job out of it. And Nikita Khrushchev said that's where the, he would, as a Soviet start, and that's where they have begun, and that's where they've been working their little fannies off for the last 50 years. So we have a lot of people that swallow the Kool-Aid and think that everything is perfect. But it's not. And um, all you have to do is read the NEA manifesto, which they have suppressed now, which basically said that in order to negotiate for the NEA, you had to be well versed in Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals, which uh, Saul Alinsky was a socialist slash communist. And we all know that. And it's interesting to see that um, we've never been able to get our hands on the fact that uh, Hillary Clinton wrote her master's thesis. Uh, uh, before she went to law school. I'm pretty sure it was her master's thesis, or might have been an undergraduate thesis, on um, the rules for radicals. And uh, I find it very interesting that Barack Obama got his training as a um, um, community organizer in the uh, bowels of uh, and rooms of. Uh, uh, Mr. Ayers, who was a uh, uh, convicted, uh, maybe not by the courts, but convicted by society as a uh, bomber uh, who believed in the tearing down of uh, the United States. Those things were never vetted for Obama. Uh, the only thing I remember about Mr. Obama when he was running for president was his wife saying that she had never really been very pleased or proud to have been an American. Uh, that's a paraphrase, but that's close to what she said, and um, nobody seemed to care. So again, uh, the left gets away with a ton of this kind of uh, abusive language, and people just, they, they, don't, they don't check into it. And so we in Vermont have the same problem. We have uh, uh, people that um, gave up their farms, um, sold them, and we've had people from all over the country mostly from the Northeast, buy up Vermont, come here to live and bring with them their liberal politics. And from a conservative state 50 years ago to a liberal state today that is, by the way, despite the fact that Wuhan virus has certainly impacted the economy, in worse shape than ever. I, and as, as I sit here right now, I'm pretty sure that we're at about $185 million in debt. And they nobody has said, that has to be added to the unfunded pension, which would put us up to three or four hundred million dollars in debt. Uh, we're not going to walk away from that. And um, anybody who thinks that somehow the government of the United States is going to bail out this state when all the other big states like our next door neighbor, uh, New York, is in billions of dollars of debt and wants a bailout. Massachusetts wants a bailout. Connecticut wants a bailout. California is begging for a bailout. These states that are run by the socialist left 
are in deep, deep trouble and they would love to have a federal government bailout. Well, what's a federal government bailout? It's you and I that pay those taxes. And so uh, Mr. Biden has already said, because he's uh, uh, tied to the New Green Deal and other left uh, programs, the uh, forgiveness of college debt, all he thinks, we're talking three to six trillion dollars on top of the debt that we've already incurred prior to Trump taking over for office and now with the <clears throat> Wuhan virus debt that we've incurred, uh, we are on an unsustainable financial path. Somewhere along the line, our children are going to have to pay for this uh, huge debt. And the only way out of such a debt is to win a war. And I don't mean a small little war, it would have to be a very big war. And so who would that be against? Well, that would be a terrible war that would be against the communist, which the biggest country housing communist is China, <coughs> the biggest landmass nation in the world <coughs> is Russia. And, and so if they were to combine forces, it could be really uh, a tragic uh, consequence. We think Wuhan virus is bad. Wait until you go to war with these two nations, and if we win, we walk away, we're out of debt. If we don't win, it doesn't matter anyway because they take over the nation, and uh, history is written by those who win the wars. It's just the way people are. And uh, so the two parts of the triangle, and uh, the next piece uh, is the uh, physical piece, which um, we in America know that the majority of Americans uh, are uh, not physically fit. Uh, we have, uh, for the first time ever, uh, a generation that will not outlive their parents. Uh, now why? Uh, genetically speaking, there's no reason that a human can't live to be 120. That's, that's, we know that. And beyond. Uh, but we have all kinds of physical education problems and the majority of it is from obesity and because we don't take care of ourselves uh, physically the mind and body don't function appro appropriately thomas edison said that the only reason that we have a body is to move the brain and that's the only reason that we have it well if you don't have a physically fit body you're not going to uh, do a whole lot of uh, conditioning and keeping it healthy. So uh, that becomes a problem. You know, when I referred a minute ago to um, the destruction of the Judeo-Christian principles, anybody that wants to go to the New Testament, look at the, the works of St. Paul, you realize that in his lifetime, he had to have walked more than 10,000 miles. And um, uh, Jesus had to have walked more than 20,000. So those two people of the Bible were walkers. They, they moved across the world on their feet. I suspect that they were very, very strong. But uh, the left would have you believe that uh, we need to destroy that Judeo-Christian principles. You shouldn't even know about St. Paul. You shouldn't know about Jesus. You should believe in those Ten Commandments given to Moses. And the great thing about the Ten Commandments and the two commandments that Jesus taught, uh, love the Lord thy God with all your heart and mind and soul. There's that triangle, and um, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, which was an embodiment of the entire Ten Commandments. The trouble with Americans and a lot of people in the world today, because we want to destroy that Judeo-Christian principle, is to realize is that there are no footnotes to the Ten Commandments. They are what they are, and they, there's, there is no uh, secularism with it. There is no thing about thou shalt not kill. Well, you can do this and that and the other thing and, and get away with it. That's not what the commandment said. So uh, those three pieces of the triangle, the left would like to destroy. And if they can, they make government God. They make government your only means of intellectual uh, ability and your only physical mean. They tell you how you will live. That is the end of freedom. That is the end of the United States Constitution. So be aware of what's going on here. That's the end of it all, is that um, 
Freedom is based on those three principles, the ability to move, the ability to read, write, and do arithmetic, and the ability to have a spiritual life, all guaranteed by the uh, Constitution of the United States, the exploration of freedom, the great experiment that's 240 years old. Well, that's all the time that I have. Again, thank you very much for watching. End of another half hour. See you next time.